Okay, we're at two minutes past the hour, so I think I'll go ahead and get us started. Thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, webinar series. My name is Tremaine Gregory. I'm a senior sustainable infrastructure scientist at the World Wildlife Fund in the United States. Um, and it's wonderful to have you here, and we have a wonderful group of uh, speakers to hear from today. This webinar series um, will be going through uh, October, and we're going to be focusing on big cats. As you all probably know, big cats are umbrella species, and impacts on them impact entire ecosystems. And they're quite sensitive to linear infrastructure, as you'll learn about uh, today. So we're interested in, in reaching people from all um, groups of society, particularly decision makers who will be uh, looking this year at different international uh, conventions and uh, treaties that have to do with biodiversity conservation. And we hope to build their knowledge on this topic. So now I'm going to introduce uh, Mary Melnick. I'm very happy to have her speaking with us today. Mary Melnick is at USAID at the Asia Bureau, and she is the Environmental Security and Resilience Division Chief. Thank you very much for being with us, Mary, and I pass the word to you. Thank you so much, Tremi, and big, warm, big cat greetings to all, and a big cat thanks to the co-hosts, the World Wildlife Fund, the Snow Leopard Trust, and the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program, known as GSLEP. Today, we're talking about linear infrastructure, that is roads, rails, fences, and transmission lines, and their impacts on snow leopards. Roads are really a very apt metaphor as well for this webinar. This webinar is the first in forging a path to a new frontier in conserving high mountain species and ecosystems in the midst of increasing infrastructure development. Continuing with this metaphor, this webinar is a road emanating from past paths and will take us to future mile markers or milestones, such as the upcoming convention on migratory species conference of parties. Regarding our past paths, our past roads, USAID is proud to have been a part of the establishment of GSLEP under a previous collaboration with WWF and the Snow Leopard Trust called the Asia High Mountains Activity. In 2013, we invested in GSLEP along with partners such as UNDT, UNDP because of the critical importance of conserving biodiversity and the need to support communities and downstream populations dependent on high mountain water to adapt to climate change. Focusing on snow leopards and wildlife friendly infrastructure is key here because it is at a minimum, a quadruple win for all of us. One, we conserve an iconic species. We also conserve an ecosystem under which humans and all manners of species depend. We conserve a watershed supplying life-giving water to people. And the resulting healthy ecosystems provide resilience to climate change. Now you may be asking, why are we concerned about roads and snow leopards? You might think these mountainous areas are vast and sparsely populated. Very true. And that there's no way a few roads could impact the snow leopard. An animal you can't even see. An animal that is called the mountain ghost. The two, roads and snow leopards, surely won't meet you might ask or think. But is it as simple as that? Today's webinar will present to you data and information about why, in fact, we should be considering the impacts of increasing roads in high mountain areas. We should consider how to avoid negative impacts and work to implement safeguard measures to maintain the snow leopard's quadruple win. In this respect, USAID will continue to collaborate with you all under the Asia Linear Infrastructure Safeguarding Nature Program led by WWF, known as ALIGN. We are grateful for the collaboration of many of you here today within ALIGN. ALIGN's work builds on an earlier linear infrastructure safeguard assessment in Asia called LISA that was led by the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. LISA also included training modules, which can be found online as well as assessments of the planned infrastructure uh, it, within Asia. USAID also began in 2020 a Big Cat Dialogue series and a Big Cat YouTube channel to highlight the links between conserving big cats and economic prosperity. We will begin production of a new series of further dialogues and podcasts again in a few months with an emphasis on infrastructure. Similarly, uh, this webinar with WWF Underline 
is also planning more Big Cats and Linear Infrastructure webinars. Our goal is that together, including all of us here today, we can build the necessary momentum to make safeguarding snow leopards and nature while providing infrastructure, high quality infrastructure, a mainstream practice and the norm rather than the exception. We welcome your continued partnership in promoting wildlife friendly F infrastructure, our actions today to protect nature and its vital role in combating the climate crisis will provide a better future for all of us and all species and work to save biodiversity. Thank you all for the opportunity to join you today. And I'm very much looking forward to the future. Over to you, Tremi. Thank you so much, Mary. So wonderful to hear your words and to hear the, the long history that USAID has addressing this question and, and your support with the line is, is just incredible. Um, okay, now I'm going to uh, introduce our moderator, and I would just like to say that during the course of this webinar, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box, and we will be addressing them live and also at the end of the webinar, we've left some time for um, more Q&A. So I would like to now introduce Sharma, he's going to be our moderator speakers. Kostub is the Director of Science and Conservation at the Snow Leopard Trust, and I've had the pleasure of working with him for the past several months. And uh, I go ahead and pass the word to you, Kostub. If you could unmute your microphone, please, Kostub. Here we are in Zoom land. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There we are. Yes. <laughs> A sentence said 100 thousand number times. Okay, no, th thank you, Tremi, for uh, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, Mary, for that uh, wonderful background. Uh, you know, you say it has been a great friend and a partner of uh, snow leopard conservation and continues to be so. Okay, coming to today's topic, we all know linear infrastructure, uh, and particularly those that facilitate transportation, they serve like uh, arteries and veins for any country's economy. They bring resources, connect people, and facilitate economic development. But then linear infrastructure is also responsible for facilitating illegal wildlife trade. They increase direct mortality for wildlife that has evolved without any knowledge of roads as a threat. It causes accidents that cost human lives, and they also have potential of transmitting zoonotic diseases to areas that have little to no preparedness to fight these pathogens. Uh, that they have never seen before. So snow leopards, on the other hand, they are the smallest of the big cat, but they're known for their massive home ranges. And being the only cat that is restricted to mountains, they do traverse uh, you know, a myriad of habitat types without uh, uh, within the mountains. Uh, when dispersing, snow leopards are known to move through all sorts of habitat that one might rarely associate with this beautiful species. You know, you might see them in a forest patch, a steppe, deep river, and at times across countries as long as they're not fenced. So a recent study uh, of snow leopard genomic diversity revealed uh, that snow leopard populations are well connected across the 2 million square kilometers and the 12 countries. What it means is that even though a third of the world's snow leopards are within 100 kilometer of international borders, these borders have remained largely unfenced over the last hundreds of thousands of years. But then that is changing fast. More and more borders are getting fenced. More and more roads are coming up, cutting across mountains and restricting historical corridors. So, and, and, and of course, not to forget railroads that, which are being planned that will completely block movement as they often uh, fully fenced. Now, it might sound doom and gloom. Fortunately, this is a problem that has a fairly straightforward solution, provided we have all the resources and all the political will to address it. So today, over the next several minutes, we will be listening to some uh, information powerhouses here who are collectively bringing with them decades of experience and knowledge. And without further ado, and uh, without getting between you all and the experts, allow me to introduce our first speaker for tonight, Tony Krivenger. Uh, Tony is a senior wildlife research scientist with uh, the Western Transportation Institute in Montana State University, and he will be talking about what makes species vulnerable to linear infrastructure, spe specifically focusing on transportation infrastructure in mountain areas. 
Over to you, Tony. Thank you, Chris. Share my screen. Everybody see that okay? Okay. Yeah, we do. Good. Yeah, I, I, uh, we, we're really limited for time, so uh, I'll, I'll jump right into my slides. Um, let's see. I get this to work properly. Yes, there we go. Okay. Um, many of you have seen these statistics, uh, the doubling of roads in the next 25 years worldwide. Uh, we may think that these remote high mountain areas that we're going to be dis dis discussing in this webinar are, are unaffected today. Uh, or will not be affected in the future. Uh, but we know that there's an ambitious, aggressive program underway globally, particularly in developing economies of Asia, Africa, and Latin America to build new and expand existing linear infrastructure, primarily roads and railways. Uh, nations are a part of this, including nations lending financing and financial institutions. Uh, the investments made today in developing Linear infrastructure will have long-lasting impacts, uh, irreversible impacts on biodiversity conservation, and the vital connections within ecosystems uh, that are needed to ensure they continue to function and thrive into the future. An example of these, uh, these pending projects can be found in the high mountain areas of Nepal, as an example, uh, an area inhabited by snow leopards, and snow leopards will be affected by these projects. These are high stakes projects um, that link two large superpowers. In the case of Nepal, we have the, the, uh, the country sandwiched between China and India. Uh, so like snow leopards, uh, Nepal uh, is basically caught in the middle of this transportation infrastructure uh, dilemma. We can talk about how linear infrastructure might impact snow leopards, uh, but what are some of the ecological impacts or threats of roads on wildlife populations? And here we see some of the, the main impacts, but really the, the primary impacts uh, affecting wildlife populations are two, their road mortality and barrier effects. And in this, in this figure, we see uh, roads have these two main impacts, mortality on the left, barrier on the right. Uh, if we look at barriers on the right, uh, this is when roads impede or they obstruct movements uh, across uh, roads to connect populations. And when this happens, we have results in a reduced population size and the ability of that population to persist over time. On the left, we have traffic-related mortality. So this is an, an individual that's, that's killed on the road while crossing. Uh, so it's essentially barrier effects because it doesn't get across the road. But at the same time, we have one less individual in the population. Uh, so this is a simple way to show how populations can diminish in size and even disappear locally uh, due to roads. This is another example. Uh, this is the Terai Arc landscape, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, the Terai Arc landscape is a transboundary landscape. Uh, so what happens in this landscape in Nepal uh, affects populations in India across the border. On the right, we see a, a metapopulation example. Now, this is a, a, basically a collection of, of subpopulations. And most wildlife populations we find today are basically consist in this pattern of, 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 of metapopulations. They are dependent. They rely entirely on dispersal and movement between subpopulations for survival. So as we see in the center, uh, this could be a core population of 100 that's severed by a road. Uh, now we have 50 in one subpopulation and 50 in the other. So the population, population has been reduced by, by half and it's 50% more at risk of going locally extinct. Snow leopards are a member of this select group of species. There are others out there as well, but uh, just to give some other examples, wolverines, Canadian lynx are part of that group. These are extremely rare species, uh, wide ranging, territorial for the most part. They occur in low densities uh, and they tend to have low reproductive rates and also low survival of their young. So wide ranging means that 
these species have a greater chance of encountering roads and rails uh, in their travels, causing crossing mortality or even crossing cessation, which results in fragmentation of the population and also deprives them of key resources, which are uh, vital for their survival. And add to this uh, their low densities or their low abundance. Uh, so it gives them less margin of error for losses from mortality and lack of connections among populations. In the planning process of impact assessments and biodiversity baseline assessments, the, the mitigation hierarchy is, is widely used. And it's great to see Prime Minister Modi uh, approving wildlife friendly projects, but mitigation sometimes falls short uh, by implementing suboptimal measures. And for some projects, it would be best to avoid entirely areas of high conservation value and species enclaves. The avoid option is rarely used in the hierarchy. Uh, there are some linear infrastructure projects where there will be cost savings, some real cost savings to investors uh, and significant uh, ecological costs saved to natural capital that is species, ecosystems, and their services, if they are avoided or even not built at all. In ending my short talk, I wanted to, to provide sort of a needs assessment. Um, throughout Asia, there's been a lot of work done to assess how best mainstream nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, including biodiversity safeguards in linear infrastructure projects. Uh, there's been significant advances in the last decade in Asia, but there's still a lot of work to, ahead to ensure that mainstreaming becomes institutionalized and safeguarding takes biodiversity conservation and ecological connectivity seriously. There are four areas of need identified. Policy and permitting. Um, the argument is that environmental concerns are low, low priority in project evaluations. Uh, there's a need to mainstream biodiversity conservation and ecological connectivity in the assessment and the design process. When these concerns are addressed in projects, particularly biodiversity conservation and ecological connectivity, they come late. They arrive at the 11th hour. Uh, they are left out of programming and budgets. And this oversight hinders the inclusion of effective safeguards and adequate budgets for them. Permitting is taking place too fast as the projects and the lenders are rushed to, to get projects initiated. And last, coordination and communication among ministries and agencies is vital for projects to be successful and to receive input from all stakeholders. So this includes ministries of public works, infrastructure, transportation, whatever it might be called, uh, ministry of the environment, finance, and banks that lend the funds. Uh, the communication all has to, also has to be vertical at all levels of government, including local level, where many key decisions are made. More research is always needed on species, ecosystems, and human impacts to their viability and function, but also there's an, a deficit of subject matter specialists in the practice of, of road ecology, that is working with the ecological side and the engineering side to inform linear infrastructure projects with the most current science and accepted international standards of practice. The general rule in linear infrastructure projects worldwide, most road projects is to accept them one by one and work on a project by project basis. And this really is a myopic approach to conservation planning with a long-term large landscape view. Uh, nations will best be served by taking a nationwide, even a multinational, transboundary approach to determine what are high cons conservation risk or high priority projects, which help guide linear infrastructure investments and result in a clear method of risk categorization. Last, one of the most important directives and technical guidelines, several nations, including Nepal, have developed these more are needed. Uh, they're well received by governments needing information to plan and design their projects. These current guidelines, however, are designed for what we might consider ordinary or your typical linear infrastructure projects, but they do not address situations where linear infrastructure projects are impacting unique 
and, e and, and exceptional species and ecosystems that require more. Permitting and finance departments, they must be trained and understand the linear infrastructure threats and complexities from these projects. Finance holds the key to funding and permitting and must be informed via training and capacity building. This takes place with government agencies, industry, consultants, and lending institutions. The Align project, this is an important part of, of the, uh, their project. Study tours with key decision makers to model projects in other countries is a compelling method of gaining governmental support for biodiversity safeguards not typically accepted. And last, foundational data uh, needs to be used more. Uh, there's many openly accessible databases uh, available today. There are many methods of having platforms store and dis display data in real time, uh, sharing it with stakeholders, and these need to be used more. So our collective goal should be to strive to create a world-class standard for biodiversity safeguards for linear infrastructure impacts for an iconic indicator species inhabiting one of the world's most harsh and fragile ecosystems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. I like the way you classify the needs, uh, the need assessments into these four uh, broad categories, and particularly looking at it not as a you know, from the firefighting perspective that you keep looking at it every time, but you really, you know, plan holistically, come together and look at it even across borders. And uh, as fascinating as it may sound, uh, some of the initiatives in the region, I think, uh, do have the, uh, the mandate and the ca uh, capability to sort of uh, help move this forward. Thank you, Tony. That was Thank very you. helpful. Uh, we'll come back to you with questions, I'm sure, okay. because our question Q&A section is getting filled pretty fast. Uh, the next speaker here is Chimed Dorj uh, Boyana. Uh, Chimed is uh, the Conservation Director of WWF Mongolia and has years of experience in dealing with linear infrastructure uh, and ecology as a challenge. Now, his leadership in working with different stakeholders to mitigate linear infrastructure challenges in Mongolia are commendable, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from him about, uh, about this in perspective of the snow leopards today. Over to you, Chimitoj. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, my name is Timmy Dorch, as, uh, as explained by the Kostyuf. I'm conservation director for the WWF office in Mongolia, and also I serve as the country coordinator for the Elian project in Mongolia. So just to, to tell you about the Mongolians, uh, Mongolian uh, nature conditions, because Mongolians are very aware of the unique beauty of the country. So we have an extremely small human population and exceptional endemic wildlife such as snow leopard, which is uh, which is on the uh, on the cover page of my presentation. The most critical threat to the Mongolian wildlife is mining, and also its associated infrastructure development, followed by overgrazing and the climate change impacts. So today I'm going to talk about the snow leopard ecology and linear infrastructure threats in Mongolia. So there are many highlights in snow leopard ecology. So but. Uh, I will focus on only connectivity corridors of snow leopard and its associated uh, linear infrastructures in Mongolia. Next slide, please. So my content will be linear infrastructure status in Mongolia and also brief information on ecology of snow leopards uh, with, the, with the focus more on connectivity corridors for snow leopard and also connectivity corridors lining with the linear infrastructures in Mongolia and also challenges and needs should be addressed uh, at the end of my presentation. So next slide, please. So this map shows the linear infra infrastructures in Mongolia spanning a total length of 45,987 kilometers. So this includes 16,000 300 kilometers of international and national highways and 3,700 kilometers of railways 
and 25,953 kilometers of the electric power, power network in Mongolia. And also the government of Mongolia is planning to extend the paved roads by nearly 3,000 kilometers and also new railways by over 4,000 kilometers to support the agriculture, agricultural, industrial, and also mining sectors. So these developments will have impacts on critical habitats such as uh, wetlands, grasslands, and also mountain ecosystems, and also increasing pressure on the nomadic and migratory species, including snow leopard and goitred gazelles, and also Asiatic wild ass in, in the Gobi area, and also the Mongolian gazelles in eastern steppe. And these uh, infrastructure development will uh, will be jeopardized the habitat of uh, of the critically endangered species. So next one, please. So WWF Mongolia led the first ever comprehensive nationwide snow leopard population assessment in Mongolia during 2017 to 2021. So with this extensive work, Mongolia became a testing ground for the GS Labs POVS initiative guideline. So POVS means the population assessment of the world's snow leopard population and also hugely contributed to the POVS guidelines development. So uh, the preliminary results of the corridor analysis of the snow leopard by our organization were used by the LISA project on special analysis of the linear infrastructure threats to biodiversity in Asia. And the key result from the nationwide snow leopard assessment is that the total distribution area is about uh, 326,000 square kilometers. And we identified 953 adult snow leopards in Mongolia, so which is regarded as the second biggest population uh, around the world. And as I said, the preliminary corridors of Israel were identified using the least cost pets. And uh, next one, please. And uh, our next one, please. Yes, that one. The previous one, please. So, and our organization has updated and refined the connectivity paths for the snow leopard along with other target species in 2022. Through the line project and key migratory species, including the snow leopard habitat, was examined within existing and proposed linear infrastructures as part of the database creation of biodiversity and uh, linear inf infrastructure information in Mongolia in 2022 and 2023. So the, the report was produced with a detailed recommendation for each planned railroad project on avoidance and also mitigation to the reduce impacts from the project to wildlife. So key results of the analysis are, for example, the snow leopard habitat is identified uh, in, in uh, throughout Mongolia and the largest habitat is 125,000 uh, square kilometers and the smallest habitat is 220 square kilometers and uh, over 32% uh, of total distribution protected under the state protected network. And the most important information is about the snow leopard connectivity corridors. We identified 107 connectivity corridors spanning a total of uh, 6,424 kilometers in the snow leopard habitat in Mongolia. So the longest one is uh, 100, uh, the longest direct distance is 196 one kilometer and least cost path is to 212.2 kilometers. And uh, the weight cost, weight uh, distance is over the uh, 4,600 kilometers. The shortest one is 10.5 kilometers to 264 kilometers. So you can see the, all the details on the below part of the uh, of this slide. So next one, please. So about the snow leopard corridors in the linear infrastructures in Mongolia, we found that the total of uh, 1,000 748 kilometers of linear infrastructure consisting of paved roads, dirt roads, and also planned railways overlaps with the core habitats of the snow leopard. 
So this includes the roads, the dirt roads, for example, 20 roads totaling 1,270 kilometers. So maximum length of the road is 106 kilometers. And the minimum length was 14 kilometers. 10 roads totaling 793 kilometers observed in one single habitat, the Western Mongolia. So namely the Altai, Altai Tawan Bogd mountain range. So this is most highly, uh, highly dense, uh, densely, density of the roads observed in snow leopard habitat in Mongolia. And also highlighted 26 intersections with the snow leopard corridors. And about the railway planet, uh, the everything uh, in Western Mongolia, we don't have any uh, railway. So we do have the plan to have the railway in Western Mongolia. So that's why there is a three railways totaling 478 kilometers. So maximum length is 200 uh, uh, 34 kilometers, minimum length is 97 uh, kilometers, and also highlighted uh, 12 intersections with the snow leopard corridors. So totally, we have identified 38 intersections. So as I said, 26 intersections with the roads and dirt roads, and 12 intersections with the railways. So it's important to note that these 28 intersections are particularly significant for maintaining the interconnectedness of the snow leopard habitats, while other intersections play a crucial uh, crucial role in supporting habitat connectivity for, for the prey base for the snow leopard. So next one, please. So this is just a photo that is showing the negative impacts of the snow leopard uh, uh, of the linear infrastructures to the snow leopard. So it happened on a territory in Western Mongolia at the midnight on September around 2017, according to the local report. So the truck was transporting the coal and as reported, the accident was happening as the snow leopard suddenly jumped into the road in front of the truck to seemingly cross the road. As soon as uh, the truck hit the predator, the driver immediately called it and informed the accident of the local police. So this is only one example. So next one, please. So I would like to share only 45 seconds video demonstrating the connectivity corridors of snow leopards and their intersections with highways in Western Mongolia. The video captures the snow leopard movement in this corridor area over the past three years, consistently observed in the same locations. So which means that Three times in three years, we observed the snow leopard movements from one single mountain to another single mountain. So this snow leopard is crossing the Gobi area between two uh, mountains. So you can easily see the herders, herder locations, and also paved roads on a, on a small video. So next one, please. So given the rapid development of the mining and associated infrastructure projects, the most effective approach to protect the species and its habitat is to expand the protected network without no border among the countries. But I think the most importantly, the conservation organizations should work on global level prediction map of the snow leopard habitat and connectivity area change over the time. So this information should be updated re regularly and shared to parties such as governments, professions, companies, and also civil society organizations to integrate the interventions for an effective conservation as well as wise decision-making of the wildlife-friendly linear infrastructure. For example, to avoid and or mitigate linear, linear infrastructure impacts or, uh, at the SL habitat and connectivity areas. So this is uh, the information from my side. Thank you very much for your consideration and the attention. Thank you, Chamizaj. That was that was a powerful presentation with some really really impactful images. Um, I, I I do agree. You make a very important recommendation at the end, which is that about the scientific assessment, not just a single assessment, but repeated assessments of distribution, abundance, and so on. And I must commend uh, you and your uh, colleagues and partners from Mongolia 
to have been behind the first ever snow leopard distribution and serve, uh, and population assessment in any snow leopard range country. Mongolia was the first to have come up with that. So kudos to you and your team and your partner organizations for having done that. But I completely am with you that uh, it requires monitoring, uh, subsequent monitoring, maybe not at the same scale, but um, at a, you know, a, a certain level for sure. Right, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon Sreshta. Sharon is the manager of uh, mountain programs in WWF Nepal. And today, Sharon is going to talk about linear infrastructure in the snow leopard habitat in Nepal. Over to you, Sharon. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kostov. And uh, thank you all the organizers for having me and all the participants for being here. Uh, I just want to start off with a uh, conversation I had with a faith leader in Dolpa as part of our project with Chief Oksundu National Park under the leadership of uh, Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation. We were trying to understand, uh, trying to gather community knowledge uh, to develop our conservation programs. So one of the leaders, what he indicated, uh, as Tony mentioned, very fragile ecosystems, right? What he spoke about the mountain landscape was, uh, in general, about nature, that nature is like an elastic rubber band. You can stretch it to an extent to make use of it, but if you stretch it too hard, it'll break and you'll get nothing out of it. You know, so I think that's one of the things that we need to understand, and uh, that's what we are trying to uh, work towards. We don't want to stop infrastructures, but we want infrastructures to ensure that nature is not stretched to an extent that it completely disintegrates. Now, uh, my presentation in the image you can see this is one of the roads being constructed. As Tony mentioned, there's a lot of infrastructures being built. And the Himalayan region, the mountain regions are in Nepal are among the uh, ones that have the highest uh, uh, number of con uh, constructions, road constructions going on. And this is one of the roads being constructed in Dolpa district of Nepal. Now, Nepal, as you know, is a very small country. We have uh, like, you know, just about 180,000 square kilometers, but even within just like about 0.1% uh, of global land mass, we have a very high biodiversity including a lot of uh, endangered and rare species, including tigers and snow leopards. So Nepal is also a stronghold for snow leopards. We have three g slep priority landscapes, and we have an estimated population, although we don't have, uh, like we haven't done the national estimation of snow leopards as Mongolia and some other countries, but a general estimate we've got is about 300 to 400, which accounts for about six to 10% of the global uh, snow leopard population within less than 2% of snow leopards range. Now, snow leopards are also considered as God's pets. So they have cultural association. Uh, I mean, uh, the communities have cultural association with snow leopards. And also snow leopards are considered a schedule one species provided legal protection by the Nepal government. Now, as Tony had also mentioned that a lot of countries uh, around the world are building a lot of linear infrastructures. And Nepal is trying to move into a middle uh, income economy by 2030. And with that aspiration, there's a lot of infrastructures, particularly linear infrastructures, particularly uh, connection, uh, like connecting communities being built. In 2018, we carried out an assessment in snow leopard landscape, trying to see the impacts of what kind of infrastructures are there and what kind of impacts might be coming up. And we found a lot of different infrastructures, a lot of point infrastructures, but there were about 13 north-south corridors, uh, road uh, roadways being built uh, that would slice through the snow leopard habitats and impact snow leopard landscapes in Nepal. Zooming into the Western snow leopard landscape, where we are currently focused, uh, this is actually a very priority landscape, uh, not just for Nepal, but it will be a very important snow leopard conservation area for the world, not just for now, but also for future. Now, this area is about, uh, area of the Western snow leopard conservation landscape of Nepal is about one, uh, is about half of the entire snow leopard, uh, uh, you know, habitat in Nepal. And within just like less than 50% of this landscape, we've found 90 snow leopards in Shea Foxulu National Park, Park alone. You may know of some studies that have predicted uh, climate-related losses in snow leopard habitat. About 30 to 40% of Himalayan landscape, Himalayan snow leopard habitats may be lost to climate changes. But as you see in this area, you'll find a lot of climate refuge and actually contiguous climate refuge here, which means 50, 70 years from now, even in the worst case climate uh, prediction, climate uh, scenario, there would still be contiguous snow leopard habitats. 
but you can see the linear infrastructures that would slice through. And if we don't take cautions, if we don't make precautions, if we don't take uh, measures to mitigate the impacts, it would be disastrous for snow leopards, not just in Nepal, but globally. Now, focusing further into Shea Fuxundu National Park, our studies showed a very high diverse uh, population of snow leopards. The 90 snow leopards that I mentioned is uh, from this area, Shea Fuxundu National Park, where Dr. Rodney Jackson, and uh, you might know of the landscape from Peter Mathison's book, uh, we carried out camera traps uh, estimation and we found about 90 snow leopards, very high snow leopard density, very high prey abundance, and also a very high livestock number. So the community is highly reliant on rangelands, not just for livestock rearing, but also NTFPs, particularly uh, cordyceps, which contribute to communities' livelihoods. Now, all of these may be impacted by infrastructure in the future. Now, I'll show you another image of infrastructures that are coming up across these landscapes. You can see a lot of these cross through high density areas. These have not yet been connected to the main network, road network of Nepal. They are in various stages, but we are already seeing that there will be potential impacts as indicated by Tony and as seen in uh, Chime Dorje's presentation. Now, uh, with respect to impacts, I think uh, uh, the previous speakers have also already covered what I'd just like to say is that these impacts not only the nature, but also communities. And these some of these impacts may be visible like these, but then there'll be a lot of other impacts which may not be uh, which may not be easily visible or tangible unless like in-depth long-term studies are carried out. Looking at some of the impacts, uh, you know, vehicle wildlife collisions, Chimedos is already indicated in uh, case of Mongolia. In Nepal, we haven't had any detections of snow leopards killed in roads, but we have had, uh, uh, you know, examples of tigers and many other different varieties of wildlife, rare endangered wildlife killed. But other than the direct killing of the wildlife, you know, that individual animals, there's also potential of the animals killed fueling illegal trade. And also potentially like increase in human wildlife conflicts, which will be put uh, like, you know, indirect impacts in a lot of other impacts of uh, infrastructures. Another thing is wildlife crimes. You may have heard, I think some uh, uh, participant also mentioned about this. There was a recent very strange incident of a snow leopard being found in lowland Nepal in about like, you know, 150 or 200 meters above sea level. Now we don't know as of now that this is absolutely related to trade, but there have been studies, there have been researches that have shown that increased access might increase wildlife crimes and that will impact snow leopards. And not just directly, but also indirectly, because if the snow leopards prey and other, uh, like, you know, con specifics are affected, we don't know how the snow leopards will be affected. So uh, the decimation of prey might also cause impact on snow leopard habitat. Now, in uh, uh, obviously, our earlier spe speakers also spoke about habitat lo loss and genetic fragmentation. Our studies, telemetric studies in uh, Shea Fuxundu National Park and Kanchenjunga area has shown that snow leopards cover a huge area. So if the if these areas that the snow leopards move and need are fragmented, then basically it might impact their population, and this would be something that we are really con we should be really concerned about. Also, like I mentioned earlier, like you know, it's not only wildlife, not only nature, but also people's lives and livelihoods that would be affected. Rangelands, for instance, are a lifeline for mountain communities. You know, in terms of livestock, in terms of uh, you know NTFPs like cordyceps. What we have is we are already seeing a huge pressure on these rangelands, despite them not being connected by infrastructures. But once they're connected by, uh, once they're connected, uh, uh, you know, the access is improved. It's likely that these the pressures will increase. Again, the pressures there are direct pressures on the rangeland, but also indirect pressures like you know increase of feral dogs, increase of disease risk, a lot of those aspects, and the destruction of tourism treks, uh, tourism routes. Increase in wildlife conflicts would affect human lives as well. There's also another angle, like, you know, in mountain regions of Nepal, we have a lot of really ancient monasteries. These monasteries are facing thefts of, you know, cultural artifacts. If this access is improved, there may be risks of these thefts, which would affect communities' potential to earn in the future from cultural tourism. There's also uh, issues of cohesion being impacted by uh, infrastructures, as some communities are interested in uh, uh, roads and some are not. 
And there's also obviously climate impacts. You can see one of the images here, the trail uh, to Foxundo. This is not uh, really uh, like, you know, uh, a motorable vehicle. But then what we know uh, from experience is a lot of the motorable vehicle routes that are taken are not scientifically decided, but based on traditional communities uh, pathways. These are expanded into roadways, which may not be stable. And you can see one example out here. Uh, having said that, as also Tony mentioned, there's a lot of milestones Nepal has achieved. Wildlife friendly infrastructure construction directives for that matter, realignment of railway track from Chitwan National Park, integration of natural resource safeguards in new projects, and also actually natural resource safeguards included in curriculum of, uh, you know, uh, engineering and forestry students. But there's still a lot to be done. Now, having said that, the road ahead is not without opportunities. Sadly, a lot of times what happens is, you know, the negative impacts, negative influences reach before conservation. We are under resource. So what happens is a lot of negative impacts reach before that. But again, having said that, there's also a lot of information that we already have. Like Nepal may not have researches done specifically on infrastructure. A lot of countries may not have a lot of Sites may not have specific uh, researches done, but we have researches done in other sites which are indicative of the threats that might face our landscape as well. So based on those learnings, I think there's a need and there's an opportunity to balance this aspiration for development with natural resource safeguards in transport infrastructure. So uh, with the support of uh, USAID Aligned Project, in Shape Poksundo National Park this time, this year, we are trying to uh, get an improved understanding of wildlife movement in the landscape, in, in the road network that is being constructed in uh, Shape Poksundo National Park to explore what kind of natural resource safeguards can be integrated. And also we are working with the local governments, sensitizing them, engaging with them, trying to work with them to, inf uh, you know, like ensure that these roads are built in a way that it does not impact their future. It does not impact the future of the community as well as the country. And also nationally, our project, Align Project, has been uh, work, uh, working with a lot of different stakeholders uh, on effective implementation of the Wildlife Friendly Infrastructure Directives, increasing awareness and capacity amongst different stakeholders, improving coordination because a lot of different agencies are involved, and ensuring that uh, natural resource safeguarding is done in all landscapes, Tarai hills and mountains. I mentioned this specifically because the lowlands of Nepal and the mountains of Nepal are completely different. And if we don't think about it in two different, uh, uh, you know, uh, like if we don't integrate the thinking while developing policies, uh, then po uh, possibly we may lose out on uh, ensuring that natural resource safeguards is done systematically. Just ending with a, so I just returned from the field. I was in Kanchenjunga conservation area, and these are just images of one protest that was going on there while I was there. So the community there were protesting against a cable car being uh, pushed to uh, in this landscape. Now, this cable car, obviously, it has a lot of impacts on the, uh, it may have impacts on nature because they might need to cut down trees. So the community are basically saying, you cannot cut our trees, you cannot cut our uh, you know national trees. But then they're also, I'm sure they're worried about their livelihoods because a lot of livelihoods would be lost. So I think there is an opportunity for us now taking all these learnings from around the world and trying to work towards a sustainable green infrastructure. I think it requires a lot of effort. And I think that's where we are going. And that's where we are looking forward to the leadership of the governments in the upcoming GSLEP, as well as all the conservation partners and stakeholders. With this, I thank you for your time. And I hand over to Kostov. Thank you, Sharon. That was that was great. I'll I'll, I'll keep it short. We are running out of time, but yes, I must mention that um, I love that analogy between nature and the elastic rubber band, uh, and that map which shows the road cutting through a high density snow leopard habitat is also an example of how data can help make an argument rather than just making an emotional appeal. So there is hard data, imagery, and it can it can make a big, big difference out there. Um, right, so our next speaker is a good friend and my ex-colleague, uh, Dr. Rishi Sharma. He's the lead of science and policy in uh, at the Himalaya Conservation Program with WWF India. I have to mention this, but Rishi has a knack of using words to create a visual effect. 
And I look forward to his take on the issue of linear infrastructure from the Snow Leopard's perspective. Uh, Rishi's presentation we've recorded in advance because we were a bit worried about his connectivity is really out in the field, but he's here with us to answer questions uh, if there are any. So uh, let, let's get to Rishi's presentation, please. Good morning, good evening, and thank you for your participation in this webinar. Now, take a moment to envision what comes to your mind when you think about the Himalayan range. Some of us will think of the stunning vistas and adventure. For some of us, it will evoke images of sprawling lush meadows with their flocks of sheep and goat, and for some, the great wilderness. Now, superimposed roads, railway lines, and imposing border fences, and imagine how they intersect and interact with the people and wildlife of the mountains. Over the decades, we have come to believe that the snow leopard habitat in the Himalayas is so remote and inaccessible that it will remain untouched by developmental pressures. And even if some developmental pressures do occur, the snow leopard range spread across a large 1.8 million square kilometer area is so vast that it will have negligible impacts. Now I wonder whether these presumptions about Himalayas and snow leopard habitats made us complacent and lulled us into a false sense of security. If you closely look at the figure on this slide, which depicts the number of studies on snow leopards in the Indian Himalayas since 1970s, you will notice that studies on snow leopards are sparse, and you might be surprised that there is no study on the potential impacts of linear infrastructure from the Indian Himalayan region. Now, infrastructure development is a crucial aspect of societal progress, yet in the Himalayan region, it is shaped by a complex interplay between geopolitical conflicts and human developmental needs. In many instances, the impetus behind infrastructure projects stems from geopolitical conflicts and strategic considerations rather than human developmental needs. Let's now examine linear infrastructure from a snow leopard's point of view. Recent studies now clarify that snow leopard is a specialist predator. You can think of it being a picky eater with a rather narrow diet spectrum and a particular preference for wild ungulates. Though it is distributed widely across Central and South Asia, it is one of the rarest big cats with lowest reported densities. Typically, fewer than one snow leopard is found per 100 square kilometers, reflecting the typical densities for these elusive cats. Female snow leopards do not tend to go far from their natal sites, and if a female is killed in a road accident or by poaching, its replacement can take a long time and slow down the recolonization and the recovery process. On the other hand, males move long distances and barriers to their movement pose a significant threat to connectivity amongst populations. We have now begun to understand some interesting patterns from our ongoing research and conservation program in the Indian Himalaya. Our observations show that roads are drivers of dramatic landscape change in the mountains and facilitate increased poaching of snow leopards and wild ungulates. We also observed that roads and related infrastructure development facilitate widespread proliferation of free-ranging dogs. The dogs not only directly compete with snow leopards, but also cause more economic losses to local communities than all the wild carnivores combined. Perhaps an unintended consequence of linear infrastructure development, particularly roads, is the intensified and unregulated tourism, which is leading to pollution, plastic waste, and degradation of Himalayan rangelands. 
and this will have cascading effects on people as well as wildlife of the region. Now looking specifically at the direct impacts on wildlife, we have observed that there is a marked decline in signs of snow leopard presence with a declining distance from roads. Reduced presence of snow leopards is evident in diminished signs such as scats, scent marks and their bug marks as you move closer to the roads. Wild ungulates too wide roads and show higher vigilance when they are closer to the roads. What we observed is that in areas with roads, species such as Tibetan gazelle, blue sheep and argali exhibit avoidance behavior and display a shorter flight distance compared to regions without roads. Additionally, there is an increase in road kills, unfortunately affecting wild ungulates and even snow leopards. Now, what should be done to address the impacts of linear infrastructure in the Himalayan region? I think first of all, we indeed need to step up the science so that we can improve measures that can help us avoid and mitigate these threats. And since a very large proportion of snow leopard habitat is across international borders, transboundary cooperation is absolutely essential. We also require informed guidelines, a supportive legislation and effective enforcement mechanisms. And since I mentioned we don't have adequate studies, I think there is a role for science in there as well. I hope these emerging findings from our work will help us move in that direction. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Rishi, for uh, highlighting aspects of snow leopard ecology that directly get affected uh, due to linear infrastructure. Uh, in the beginning, I mentioned about a genomic study that has recently been concluded. What I want to mention here is that the study also revealed that snow leopards have the least genetic diversity among all big cats. What it means is that their population has likely been rather low, maybe about 10,000 individuals, even half a million years ago. But it has managed to sustain because of its ability to disperse, emigrate, and populate distance, distant mountains. How will that be affected when linear infrastructure is developed without taking into account the animal's ability to, uh, to disperse and emigrate? It's anybody's guess. Okay, so with that, uh, I know the the speakers are not off the hook yet. We are almost out of time. I don't know, uh, Tremi, uh, Vicky, how much time can we take uh, for Q and A? One minute. <laughs> I think about one minute. <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, we have some incredible questions. What I would like to uh, propose is that we can take one of these questions, and uh, that's a question for Tony. Uh, let me ask that. And the remaining questions, we will make sure that these get posted on the YouTube channel and wherever the Q&A are posted, along with answers from our experts. Some of the questions I've already tried to answer, so uh, in the meanwhile. Um, I think this is a question by Gokarna Jan Thapa, who says, one of Nepal's colored sub-adult snow leopard had traveled about 2,000 kilometers and found to have crossed, sorry, uh, to have crossed uh, roads in China. His question to you is, may the road impact the snow leopard genetic dispersal, habitat utilization, and ecological barrier? Tony. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, this is probably a sub-adult. Um, you know, it's always good to have dispersal across roads. And in this case, this, this one did get across the road, it sounds like, multiple times. Um, the... The, the thing that made me think about this was just what you said about snow leopards having the least amount of genetic diversity of, of, of all the cats. And it really tells you how precarious it is, you know, the, the situation if you start having roads and railways, you know, a species which is, you know, assumedly sensitive to any sort of human disturbance, human uh, activity, roads, rails, et cetera. Uh, what is important is is to have these breeding females. You know what we found uh, in in our work here in North America, uh, not just sub adult males, but but having the breeding females crossing the, the this linear infrastructure and, and doing that through through 
mitigation, whether it be tunnels, viaducts, flyovers, big, big structures. So that will be really be the key for, for seeing whether or not any sort of mitigation is, is effective. And that's what we'd want to look for. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I might just breach the instruction and ask one more question. This is from Andre Baranik. Andre is asking that all EIA laws mandate public consultations. How effectively are these being used? And I might request our friends from Nepal and uh, Mongolia to just, uh, if any of you can take this one, what do you think, uh, what's the level of uptake of these uh, mandates of public consultations? Are they being done or they, that needs to be strengthened? Because this is going to feed very well into the, uh, into the policy framework that we are trying to work at the GSLEP program. Any of you? Maybe Sharon, you can go. Uh, sure. Thanks. Sure. I think it's a really sure. uh, it's a very a very important question. Yeah, I think there are policies. There are good policies, but then I think the implementation part is pretty weak everywhere, right? I mean, that's that's one of the major issues that we face. And implementation part is weak because there are multiple stakeholders. And I'd just like to go back to what Tony said. Like you know, some experts, like experts on snow leopards, may not be experts on infrastructures, and experts on infrastructures may not be experts on wildlife behavior. How do we come together, bring together our knowledge, work together towards improving the EIA? I think that would be the point that we would need to look uh, to in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, I think that's where my job gets over tonight, but I'll just, uh, I'll still mention that it has been an incredibly informative session. I'm really grateful to all the speakers for throwing light uh, on the issue of linear infrastructure as a potential threat. But what I would want to highlight here is that for all its negative impacts, linear infrastructure can also be looked at from the opportunity that it brings to strengthen the local economies and bolster their ownership and role in conservation on, in conservation of biodiversity. Um, and just want to reiterate that while we cannot deny access uh, to, to these remote human populations who deserve economic development as much as you and I do, we can certainly design these better to minimize threats to human and wildlife populations and maximize economic benefit from the veins and arteries of uh, our economies, which are these uh, linear infrastructures. Over to you, uh, Tremi. Thank you so much, Kustu, for, for those closing remarks. And I will say that linear infrastructure is difficult to avoid. Um, I saw a presentation this week about a road in Peru that um, there was a push to build since pre-Incan times. So, and it was built uh, a couple of decades ago. So when a road wants to be built, it will find a way to be built. So therefore we need sustainable infrastructure solutions. And I will say that um, we've formed a working group to address the question of linear infrastructure threats to snow leopards. And we've developed um, at the moment, a document evaluating those threats that's going to be uh, presented at the, the GSLEP steering committee meeting, which is uh, in two weekends, and then at the uh, Convention on Migratory Species uh, COP in um, Samarkand in Uzbekistan. So uh, we're looking at solutions. We're looking at the ways to do it right. Um, and uh, we hope that you will uh, take a look at those documents as we disseminate them. So thank you all for being here today. We'll let you know about the next uh, webinar in our series. It will probably be in uh, April. And it's been wonderful to have these speakers. I've learned a lot. Um, and um, I look forward to connecting more in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.